From the slums of Chicago to the hills of Hollywood to legendary Carnegie Hall, award-winning actress, author, and teacher Susan Slavin has always triumphed over adversity. Born into abject poverty and a family crippled by severe mental illness, Susan created miracles in her own life and the lives of others against all odds. I am absolutely thrilled to have Susan on Never Ever Give Up Hope today, and you are in for a real treat. Have you ever felt like giving up, quitting, throwing in the towel? Welcome to Never Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Grant. She's an author, health coach, and motivational speaker. Backed into a corner multiple times in her life, Carol shares with you stories on how she overcame some of the toughest obstacles a person can go through in life, but refused to give up hope. Rather than admit defeat, an opportunity was presented, and it involves each and every one of you. Carol will feature spectacular guests who will share their messages of hope, encouragement, and their inspiration to prove why life's adversities only make you stronger. And now, welcoming the host of the show, here's Carol Graham. give up hope and honestly I have as you know many hundreds of guests that have been on this show as I was preparing for Susan Slavin's interview today I didn't know where to start because she has so much to share and I know that you listeners don't have 10 hours to listen so we're going to capsulize it and you don't want to miss one thing that Susan is going to share today. Welcome, Susan. <laughs> oh my God, Carol, what a lovely introduction. <laughs> um, I am already so moved and, and touched by you, as I've written to you, I am so touched by you and who you are and what you're doing, but I'm so touched with the introduction that somebody I want to know, you know? Yes, exactly. I want to know her. Well, we're, gonna, we're all going to get to know you at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you're right that I could speak for hours. I have so, you know, I always felt that I was bursting with things to give to the world mm -hmm. uh, from my earliest memories, I always... And there was no way to get it out there, you know. And um, little by little, I managed once one brick at a time to get my heart out there, my right. soul. So this is a lovely, a lovely opportunity. Oh, I'm so happy. Well, we're going to have a great time. So yeah, let's absolutely. start, as we always do on this show, from the beginning. Tell yeah, me a little yeah. bit. Tell us about your childhood. Oh, wow. Okay, let me start at the very beginning, which my birth. I was uh, an eighth-month baby and almost strangled at birth, and it was dire. And the, as the story goes, which will give you an idea of the point of view of my family, um, the doctor came to my father and said, there's a big problem. I don't know if we can save both of them the baby or your wife, who, who should we save? Oh, if you wow. can save? And he said, my mother, you know, the wife, but which was okay, I guess, if you hadn't told me that <laughs> all through my childhood. So that's where it starts. I knew that I was not wanted. So let me give you a little bit about the mental illness in the family. Now I have the titles, Carol for what they are. At the time, I knew they were crazy. I knew that from as soon hmm. as I could open my eyes. Hmm. But I didn't really know, I didn't understand for a long time that they were mentally ill. And the diagnoses came later. So I'll give you the diagnoses just so you have a cast. Sure. Of Sister, the baby, is a paranoid schizophrenic violent, was violent completely, and uh, dominated our existence. My brother 
I'll call him the other brother, not the, the main evil brother, <laughs> uh, the other brother. Uh, he was, uh, by the way, we're all dark haired, light skin, dark eyes. And he was a redhead. A redhead in this family? Where did he come from? And we, we never figured that one out. But anyway, he became a severe manic depressive, violent as well. It was actually jailed. And his story is probably the most heartbreaking of all of them. My older brother was a generation older than me. Well, he was the only functional person that I knew about in my life. And he was a paranoid schizophrenic as well. I mean, he, he had a breakdown for a couple of years where he was completely incapacitated with um illness but he was functional and he wound up being very successful and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, my father was post-traumatic stress he lived in a state of complete alarm it was like there was always a fire and he was always shaking from head to foot and screaming everything was hysteria and then my mother, who in a way is the star of the story, <laughs> they're so complex, uh, delusional, completely delusional narcissist who lived in a fantasy world of show business and food and was obese. Uh, and my sister is obese as well. So that's the cast. <laughs> Where we grew up, uh, examples of the abject poverty, I grew up in a transient hotel in the slums of Chicago. And it was a place where you could sort of the down and out wound up. <laughs> and there was a cast of characters in there that are, you know, material for many, many movies. But like the prostitute on my floor who kept the door open a little and you'd see the people <laughs> going in and out. Um, and, but it was colorful. It was colorful and scary. And, you know, it was just rough and tumble. But that was my home, and it was small. There were five of us living in this furnished apartment all through my childhood in Chicago. The poverty is almost hard to explain how bad it was. Before I was born, their poverty was much worse. And I found out this later when my brother, he's another, he's a full generation older than me. So there were two generations, uh -huh. the brothers and the sisters. Uh, so my parents were older, but my brother, he explained to me that when they, when he was growing up, they had much less, like they had a room and basically my grandfather slept with his feet in the oven because that was as much space as they had. Oh my goodness. So, and they had like, he was performing since he's nine years old, he's very talented and he would win a little contest and come home to share the little bit of food he had with the family or one piece of one roll would go for the whole family. So by the time I came onto the scene, there were five of us in one tiny, tiny apartment, but there was a bedroom and I slept in a bed with my mother my whole life uh, until we got to Hollywood, which is another story. Uh, and my sister, the baby, slept in a crib right next to us until she was 11. But my father and my other, I'll call him my other brother, the redhead, slept on a bed in the living room. So to say that it was ugly and squalor, like I remember like one towel for the whole family for the week and horrific nutrition but a lot of fantasy, I'll tell you, <laughs> these people <laughs> lived in another world. So it was like the best way to describe it, I think, is living in an asylum where the inmate got control. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> what a description. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit about a couple of uh, anecdotes that will give you the, f the flavor of it, which is when I other than them telling me that they chose my mother. My very first day of kindergarten, which I was looking so forward to, I wanted out into the world. I wanted to go into the world. So the first day of school, I was nervous, scared to death, but the whole family overslept. And I got up in a panic, and 
they said, oh, I guess we missed it. And I said, what do you mean? I'm like five. And they said, well, we're, it's too late. I said, you've got to go. You've got to go. You, and I, I literally begged and forced somebody to get dressed and take me to school. So that, that's an example of the passivity, the negligence, and that I was responsible for the ground that I walked on. And that was my childhood. And when I was seven, my mother did an insane thing, which is another story that's too long to tell, but she got one of my aunts to disguise themselves as the principal of my school and call me. And I was always a very shy, very super shy. And all of a sudden she said, there's a phone call for you and the principal, who? The principal of my school wants to talk to me? It was a terrifying moment. And basically the principal admonished me for doing this thing my mother didn't want me to do. And I was mortified, humiliated. And basically the principal made me promise I would never do this thing again. I, I said, okay, I hung up the phone and the humiliation that the whole mm-hmm. school, the big public school would know about how bad I was, was just, it was beyond anything. And shortly after that, I couldn't leave the house. I, I stopped going to school. Uh, so there was a year where I became incapacitated, frightened to go out of the house, frightened to leave my mother. And whether it was related to that incident, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But it seems likely, Carol, that it was. During that period, I kept trying to go back into the world, and I couldn't do it. I think my greatest achievement in life at seven, it really happened because I kept trying to go back, trying to go back to school. I missed a whole year and I'd go out of the house. I think I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then I run back home. And then finally, one day I said, this is it. You're going to go to school. And I forced myself. And at seven, I made that decision to live and to go into the world. And I never turned back. But it was a big one because I was petrified. And so a lot of these childhood fears Mm -hmm. stayed with me and the fears of the family were in me. And I'll talk about the fears of my sister who was completely uh, had agoraphobia, couldn't go out for 12 years. But anyway, they're dramatic stories. (laughs) One thing I will say, but my brother, the nemesis of my life, just to give an example of him before I give any details, he would have seemed like the one that would have helped me to get out into the world. He was already in the world. He was an entertainer. He was a comic. And he was, I didn't know this until much later, just how brilliant he was, but he really was. But to me, he was evil. It's like he hated me on sight. So he, he tried to stop me at, at every turn. But when I was seven, I was still terrified. This was a point I couldn't leave my mother. And there was a big event where my mother finally got to go to a nightclub. And it was her dream. And I became hysterical because I couldn't let go of her. My only safety was this neurotic hanging on to her. And they tried to get me a babysitter. And I want, I helped my mother get dressed to go. I was the one who would try to help her always. I was her little mother. Dress her because she had no taste and I had taste. I sort of freaked out and I didn't know what to do because I was trying to get her ready to go. And then they brought this babysitter in that terrified me and I couldn't handle it. And so I just started crying and crying. I wasn't, I wanted her to go, but I couldn't let go. And then my brother said he was, he was at this nightclub. Well, that he was going to come back and kill me. And, and basically I thought he was, I thought he was going to come and kill me. And just uh, I I was just hiding behind her or I lived through the night. She stayed with me. And then the next day we went back. We were on a little trip. We went back to Chicago. And before we left, I was hiding in the car because I thought he's going to kill me. He didn't kill me. He just looked in the window of the car and he just stared at me. And he said, you're no good, Sue. You were just born bad. And I was seven. So that was the brand. Oh so that's sort of the context of, I think maybe that gives you a little of the flavor of uh, the mental illness 
and the poverty. Well, I really appreciate you sharing that because I did not see that in your notes or on the website and it does paint the picture because you have been so successful in so many arenas and it started obviously from day one and the tenacity whether it was inherent the struggle to be born and to stay alive you know that was amazing so yes thank you for sharing that now Tell us what happened to your sister when your mother died. You know, I always felt like my sister was not going to have a chance unless I stepped in and helped her. And I had that from the earliest memories um, where the principals would call me to school because she was hyperactive. She wasn't yet. We didn't know how bad it was. And she was sweet and fun and full of life. I sort of took her under my wing very, very early. We had moved to Hollywood uh, as I was following my dream, and I'll go into that if we have time. If not, it's fine. I moved there when I was uh, 13 and 14. At that point, my sister, really her paranoid schizophrenia, started to really present itself, and she became a monster. And she was violent and uh, we got kicked out of one apartment after another because of her loudness and her threatening all of us all the time. When I left Hollywood to go back to New York because I was called to New York by direct, she pretty much kicked me out of the house when I was like in my teens. Get rid of her, get rid of her, get rid of her. And she wouldn't let me be with my mother, whatever. I had no time with my mother. Every time I walked into a room, get rid of her. And my mother was afraid of her. The whole family was afraid of her. And so in a way, the greatest gift she gave me was it was unbearable to live there another day. And when I got called to New York by this famous director, it was a ticket out of a burning building. And I left them all behind. I, and I cut off my heart. I t- tried to leave them all behind. Um, but I didn't talk to them for maybe nine years which was a long time. I just was trying to survive. Mm -hmm. But at the time, my sister kept deteriorating, deteriorating. And I thought, what are they going to do with her? What are they going to do with her? And this was the point where she never left her one spot on the couch for 12 years, except once a day and to go to the bathroom. And my mother would feed her junk food every day, all day. Hmm. And she grew sicker and sicker and bigger and bigger. And I thought, well, how is this going to end? What is the end point of this? And I saw that this was going to get worse and worse if my father died. He did die. And then they were left. They wound up in an assisted living home with terrible, terrible human beings running it, terrible managers. And they said, because my sister was still loud and overbearing to my mother in their little room, when your mother dies, we're putting you away. Hmm. Well, my sister was smart enough to know that she had to somehow escape. My mother got very ill, was taken by ambulance to the hospital, and my sister bolted. She just bolted into the streets. She had no ID. She hadn't been out for years, probably 12 years. She had no way of communicating to any human, and she was homeless. And I had been trying to reach her by phone for years to just get her to come to the phone, and she would not. So one day, I get a call, and it was from this person called my sister. And she's the one that let me know that my mother was in the hospital. And she could barely talk. I was trying to draw her out. She let me know that it was bad. And I said, well, what do you where are you? What are you going to do? And she wouldn't tell me where she was. I didn't, I had no idea where she was. I, she was in the streets for a while and then she got to a phone. I had a, this went on for, I guess, a period of a few weeks where I had to figure this out. She would call every now and then. I didn't know where she was calling from. At this point, I had managed to already have a life and success, but it was always with this tug in my soul. I was haunted by her story, my sister's story. And 
I thought, if my mother dies, what happens? My mother did die. And all of them, even my therapist, the people who loved me the most said, you can't, Susan, you can't. You can't go back. It, they, they were worried that it would devour me, as their, life, their lives always were devouring to anybody in their world. And I didn't know if I was strong enough, Carol, to be honest. I truly didn't know if I had the strength, the time, the energy, the finances to go back and do what I could. I made the decision. Everybody was against it. I followed my heart. I said, you have to. It became very clear to me. I had to go back and find her and do what I could. Buried my mother. (laughs) We had already resolved some things, and uh, I was trying to help her a lot in the last years of her life. And I buried my mother, which was literally with a shovel. Um, It was a part of the tradition at that time. I had things that I thought I would never, ever be capable of. And then I finally found out where my sister was staying in a motel, the only one on planet Earth that would take somebody (laughs) with no credentials, no money, no anything. She had like a couple more days to live there. And I went there and found her. She couldn't speak, basically. She was traumatized and she was obese and couldn't communicate. And I had noticed at the bottom of her bed was a Bible. Now I'm going to start crying. Oh, boy. And she had been on her knees praying to God for help because she was left alone in the world. And I guess that God gave me the strength to find a home for her. Not, I guess, I know God gave me the strength. And it wasn't easy because everything I found, and I had been researching in New York for weeks before because I anticipated that this was coming. And I had all these ideas and places and every single one of them she rejected. This wasn't right. This wasn't, she wouldn't do this. She wouldn't do this. And I finally found her this assisted living place where when I came up in the middle of the night, I remembered it. And I, all of a sudden, like at midnight, I finally remembered it and I, that it was a place I should investigate. And I went there in the middle of the night and it was like the angels <laughs> were, were singing when I saw the front of the building. I thought, this is it. This is it. Then the trick was getting her there the next day, which I managed to do, which was no small feat. And of course, she rejected it. She completely rejected it. And I said, this was my last hope for her. And I, and I had to go back to New York. And I knew if she didn't stay there, she was going to be homeless on the streets. And I couldn't help her. And I was begging her. And she was just said, no, no, no. Because she found out it had a bathroom down the hall. Nope, nope. And then I just lost it. I started sobbing. And I, I started crying. And I said, my worst fear what was my whole life has been what would happen to you when mother and father die. And I just couldn't stop crying. And somehow that reached her. Wow. And she sort of patted me on the arm. It was amazing. That was the first reaching out she could ever do. She sort of patted me. And I knew she'd stay. And I, I got her that place. And that was the beginning of the odyssey of her living on her own and insisted a safe place. She lived there. I but she was still insane and paranoid schizophrenic and not in the world. And along the way, and this was the hard part, Carol, I managed to get her medication and which is something they don't believe in medication in my family. Uh Uh, I got her psycho drugs and got her to the right doctors, et cetera. It started working and then she'd go off them completely and she'd get crazy again. And when I say crazy, I mean the kind of crazy you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy, where she and her schizophrenia really believed that she was responsible for the worst tragedies on earth that could have happened. And I I won't, because I don't want to betray her confidences, but she was certain she caused them. And so she was just waiting for them to come get her. So she lived in, oh, it was horrible. That's talk of paranoia. And, okay, let me cut to the end of this story, which is she's doing great now. <laughs> I, I kind to- of had that feeling, and I was hoping that that's uh, yeah, the, yeah, what you were going to say. Story. Awesome. Yeah, she's doing, she's doing great. And she's on medication now for several years. And she now lives in Beverly Hills yet. 
uh, in a better assisted living place, and she loves me beyond reason. Oh, uh, that's wonderful. Yeah, she thinks I'm the best thing that's oh, ever happened. You, you <laughs> saved her life. You saved her life, literally. And and she, and she, she knows, it, you know, and th- she has gratitude that's quite beautiful. And we have a relationship. I mean, it's long distance one, right. uh, but we have a relationship. And it's quite beautiful. Now, there's another story that I'd like to you to share, if you could kind of capsulize it, because we are getting to the point where we really want to hear about what Susan's all about now. You yeah, have painted yeah. an incredible picture of what you've had to go through. And, you know, my heart is just like aching and rejoicing and because I know the end of the oh. story all at the same time. But before we do that, let's, before we go into what you've accomplished, what you are offering the audience today, all the different aspects of your life that are so upbeat and remarkable. Let's just touch for a couple minutes on the devastating phone call you got from your brother, which continues to paint the picture you're painting. And then uh, we'll talk about the good stuff. (laughs) Okay, I'll try to make this brief. These things, you know, that's why I could talk for hours and hours. Okay, so I get a phone call. My estranged older brother, who has always basically had branded me as a bad, as the bad seed. And he called me and he, we hadn't talked for years. And I knew if he called, there was, it was not good. And he called to tell me that his daughter had died that day. And I, uh, his son had already died a few years before of alcoholism. And when I heard that, I thought, oh, dear, I, you know, how much tragedy can one family take? And I said, how is Boots, which was his wife? And he said, oh, she died a year and a half ago. And he never told me. So this is, and he was on his last legs. He was ready to die. He was ready packing it. And I knew my heart just opened. And I said, what can I do to help you? Basically, there was no answer to that. We hung up, but we had phone numbers now. And my husband, my brilliant husband, said, I think we should go back there. And I just listened. And we planned a trip. And we went back. And he was remarkable. I mean, now he'd lost everything. Talk of somebody being stripped bare. A kidney transplant. He had seven operations. He lost his wife. He lost his son. He lost his daughter. I was the last one standing. And the fact that he reached out to me was even astonishing. So we were, we went back for just a week, and he was ecstatic. You know, in his frailty, he planned mm. to take this place and that place, and he had a home at this point. He had a swimming pool. This was astonishing to me from the background that he came from as well as our background. He managed to have success that he didn't really know he had, and he managed to innovate one comedy thing after another, became the head writer for um, Joey Bishop, actually, for many years, uh, became just, he became like an icon in his business. This was when I knew him, he was, he was just a struggling, you know, person who was failing all the time. But he really did become quite successful, but he had no sense of identity. I thought I could confront him about what he'd done to me in my childhood. And I thought it was the right thing to do, because I thought, how can I go through my life, and he's here now, and not ask him why he would treat a child like that. So I was all prepared to go in the other room and just ask him. And my husband walked into the bedroom. I said, I'm going to go talk with him. And I told him why. And my husband said, I don't think it's a good idea, Susan. I said, well, no, I have to. I have to. I have to know why. I don't want to be mean about it. I just want to talk. I wanted closure. And he said, it's up to you, Susan. Mm -hmm but I don't think you're going to get what you want. I was sobbing, 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 and I listened to him. And I chose to not walk into the living room and confront him about the past. I chose to walk in and go out to dinner with him that night. And from that moment, I just chose to love him in the present. And what came out of that, we became soulmates. (laughs) We fell in love with each other. I did 23 sessions with him as a teacher where he became my student by coaching his career so that the last five years of his life were the most spectacular he ever had. 
I became his publicist. I did all his all his PR. I got him back to all his contacts. I got him back into the world. And we we just loved each other deeply. And I became had his power of became you know power of attorney. And I was with him on his final day of life on this earth, making the decisions when to take him off. You know, short we wound up in such love and it was the forgiveness that changed me so i'll end it there and so much of what you said like i understand how difficult it is for you to share it's also difficult as a listener to listen because you want to you want to help you want to fix but i also know that you needed to share that because the audience needed to hear who you were from day one is part of what you have and who you have become and that is mind-blowing so before we do that we're going to take a short 30 second break and we're going to come back with some incredible stories and also how you can help the audience in a variety of ways so that's exciting too we will be right back Carol Graham would like to show you the path from misery to miraculous triumph in her fast-paced memoir, Battered Hope. She relates her determination to succeed as someone who experienced one horrendous nightmare after another, gang raped and left for dead, loss of a child, husband falsely imprisoned, and cancer. Nothing could break her tenacity or faith. No matter what you face, heartache, loss, suffering or injustice, Carol will illustrate how she became a victor the same way you can. The secret is to never, ever give up hope. Order your copy at Amazon or batteredhope.blogspot.com. Well, my head and my heart are spinning as I have been listening to Susan Slavin's story today. I already knew a lot about her and her story to hear it with her emotion with her excitement of some of these devastating things in her life and how she was able to turn them around this my friends is just the beginning because what she is going to share now and how accomplished she has become and and what a delight and a reward to the audience to hear what she has to share you have to listen to this story to the end it is stimulating motivating exciting wonderful all those things so let's now start with how did these contribute to your own healing process you know when you start with zero (laughs) there's no place to go but up you know so that that was helpful also I had such a vivid example of what was wrong with everything they did thought and were it was such blackness and negativity and bleakness that I knew there had to be a better way I, from the earliest age, knew that this was not what life was meant to be. And whether I was born with it, the impetus that I got from their devastation and watching them get worse and worse and worse inspired me forward that I would never make the same mistakes. I would never be let life grab me and be a victim of my circumstances. So I think that that gave me a lot of the drive that I have. And I think it strengthened my spiritual connection with God. I felt always that God was there with me. So I, does that answer your question? Yes, Carol? yes. Now, you got a scholarship to the famed yeah. Chicago Art Institute at age 12. Yeah. And, and then following your dream of becoming an actress to Hollywood in your early teens, you quickly became a working actress and you won numerous awards. So give us a little synopsis of that part of your career. Okay. I'll try to be succinct because that was miracles. I 
saw in Chicago when I was like t- about 12. I was going to the Art Institute. I was an acknowledged artist. And I was an A student all my life with no obvious acknowledgement from my family. Or, But I, in the real world, I was getting acknowledgement. But I knew that I was more than an, an artist, a fine artist. I had this burning fire in me and I knew that my future was as an actress and it was a dream that everybody absolutely didn't believe in thought it was a fantasy and put me down for it etc but I begged and cried and begged and begged more and I said we've got to go to Hollywood we've got to go to Hollywood we've got to go to Hollywood and I just kept begging and finally because my father had no job they were struggling they just listened finally and we packed up and got to hollywood when i was 14 as soon as i was planted in hollywood the studio gates would open everything worked in hollywood for me it was a miracle that happened so quickly you can't believe it because after having no acknowledgement or being seen in my family all of a sudden everybody got me and i I was at, I got into Hollywood High, which was a miracle in itself to be in the right zone of the one block away. I wouldn't have gotten into Hollywood High. Oh, my goodness. And everything worked. And then at Hollywood High, the very first thing I ever did at Hollywood High, the teacher told his 10th. I was, you know, brand new into the 10th grade. I had actually got to a bank off. A high school, I mean, junior high before that. But by the time I got to Hollywood High, very first little monologue I did, he told the 12th grade classes, you better watch out because there's somebody who just came into the school. You better work very hard. So I was, <laughs> and I, I was acknowledged from the get-go. And anything I did, I put my heart and my soul, my all my creativity into, and everything I, I started I was told again and again I was the star at Hollywood High. I became a legend, as they tell me. I won every award that you could win there, and then I won every award locally, the state, and then I was going to nationals, and it was. And then I started working as an as an actress, and then being discovered by Jerome Robbins. I knew I was going to be in film, and I was always looking for my role you know it didn't occur to me that you had to have years and years of experience I thought start at the top where do you want to be I love it (laughs) that's where I always started um so I wanted to be that star and this role came along in this play called West Side Story they were making a film and when people uh in Hollywood High saw me on stage doing something else and said wow, we just saw this play downtown called West Side Story. You're perfect for Maria. And then I got the album, et cetera, and I knew I was it. I knew it. But nobody else did. Nobody else called me, and I tried everything to get a, an audition, and I could not, even though I had all these awards, I could not get an audition. Even my high school acting teacher who believed in me, the studio called him looking for an unknown. He passed on me because they were looking for Audrey Hepburn, um, a Spanish Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> he didn't think I fit the bill. So he passed on me. So I could not get in. Everybody said no, said no. But I never lost faith that I was getting in there. I was just waiting. I tried every single angle. Finally, somebody had discovered me before. And I hadn't talked to for about a year got me in out of the blue the call came in while I was in school and long story short when I got in to my first audition I mean I was scared to death the the casting director very famous casting director said how are you Susan today and I said nervous you know I I was always myself I I was nervous he said why are you nervous I said well because this is important you know I never had a facade um so he, he related to me right away, and they it was like a fast track. I got to audition then for Jerome Robbins, for Robert Wise. Uh, these, you know, Jerome Robbins was a legend. Robert Wise was a legend. 
And they kept calling me back, calling me back. I wound up having seven screen tests for Maria and worked on the film for many weeks and privately with Jerome Robbins, uh, working on the scenes and the dances. And it had gotten down to the point where after this national exhaustive search for an unknown, I was it. They also, unbeknownst to me, were also working on finding a box office star. And it got down to Natalie Wood and Susan Slavin. And uh, the powers that be chose the box office star. But uh, apparently I made a mark. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, wow. Because a lot, a lot of what I did wound up in the movie. And then I got this incredible uh, letter from Jerome Robbins. And then he, uh, a little bit later, he brought me to New York. It all worked out very well. And you also wrote your own play, did you not? Oh, my God, I did. So at a certain point... Uh, you know, being an actress, I didn't like the feeling of having no power in my own destiny. And, you know, an actress is just a hired hand, which is a glorious thing when you're hired. But at a certain <laughs> point, I wanted I wanted more of my story and my artistic expression. And it I just it became again a vision. I saw myself on stage. And then I saw my mother on stage, and I thought, well, why don't I do them both? I thought, what? Nobody had ever done anything like At this point, nobody had ever done a one-person play. Uh, they've done, you know, characters, or they've done cabaret acts, or they'd, but nobody had ever done, uh, created, I created a play with a beginning, a middle, and end of this girl transcending a narcissistic mother. And I played oh all the goodness. roles. I was on stage for two hours mm. without an intermission, with no props. And it was a huge success. It was called Mother Love. Oh, my word. Now, is can anyone see this now? Of course, it was a play, but has it ever been put into a... It uh, hasn't. You know, that's a good question, Carol. I always feel a version of it is going to be on film. A mm-hmm, version. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I have a production company with my husband, and we produce many exciting theatrical things. And we have a we have film things we're working on. We're working on a TV show now, and properties that we have for film. So, yes, everything's in the works right now for wonderful creative um, things that are part of my story, but that come through other people's stories as well. And that all the films that I have planned on doing in our company, they're all inspirational. I mean, all my work, everything I did on stage, anything that I've written is all about uplifting people, giving them hope, giving them inspiration that they can transcend their circumstances and that anything is possible. And that's what my life is about is to give people that vision that what is can change if we change ourselves that the only way out is in you have to go in to your demons you have to go in to your heart you have to go into your beliefs and um, that's what I my whole life is about as an actress as a teacher as you- you're the poster girl. I tell you, you're the poster girl for that <laughs> success story and to help oh. others. So now, what are you doing to bring that about? I know that you're, you've you got some things in the works regarding helping other people, etc. So share a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, this, this is an amazing thing. This was where my love story begins. I I always wanted to be loved, but it seemed like that seemed like it was never going to really happen. And then God delivered me (laughs) this angel. And his name is David Kibbe, and he's my husband. And we've been together for a very long time. And he was the missing piece because he loved me from the get-go unconditionally. And it just grows every day. And I built my own identity in the world with my own acting career, my own writing career, my own school. I helped him, and he built. He wrote a best-selling book called David Kibbe's Metamorphosis. 
and it's about inner and outer beauty and it's about transformation and it includes everything that my life has been about which is about identity and how important and this was one of the fundamentals of my school that actors have to have their own identity actors were trained before i came on the scene uh-huh, to uh-huh. merge their identity no i don't believe in that i believe you become greater by being more full and whole yourself and so long story short at a certain point we joined forces and now we have um a global business all over the world where people travel to us from every corner of the earth and we do these head to toe transformations on their inner and outer life and give them their wings to fly towards their dreams but they have to look great while they're doing it (laughs) so they so we wardrobe them in and in and out yeah i love that line that's pretty perfect pretty thrilling what we're doing now and that and what that has done for me as an actress is my global reach is beyond anything i could have imagined and we just found out we went viral (laughs) on tiktok (laughs) Which is just beyond me because I have no uh, uh, social media skills, really. <laughs> okay. This, this just happened. We just it's it's sort of taken off. It's a life of its own. This well, where on TikTok created. can people do people look at your name? Call David Kibbe, you know, you just look up okay, David. Okay. Okay. And you'll see it. And and it's our joint effort now uh, to bring what we teach at the deepest levels, the highest levels. And the most beautiful levels. It's all about beauty, inner and outer beauty, and beauty being a fundamental of life and style being the way you tell your story to the world. So in the process, one of my dreams always was about looking beautiful. I became a style quote icon, which is if these are things that the magic that comes and finds you if you follow your heart and soul. You know, it's funny as you're as you're painting that picture. I'm thinking about the little girl sleeping in that apartment and not having food and not having a washcloth or a daily bath or all the you know all those things. You talk about a transformation. Oh my yeah. goodness, this oh, is th- this has been amazing, absolutely amazing. So, in well, summary, what would you like to share with the audience? You have so much to offer. And we could easily talk for hours. But in summary, what would you like to share? Okay, there's, I guess, the power of desire. I mean, there's so many things that I want to share. Create your life by design, not by fault. Nothing is impossible. Everything is possible. Dream big, start small. It's not one dream. (laughs) You can have it all. Um, But the power of desire, I think that's the main thing that I will leave you with. Um, first of all, my, my purpose is to bring beauty to the world. First, to my own life, obviously. Beauty, joy, and light. And I want to bring it to the world and bring heaven to earth, basically. But the power of desire in doing that. I, I work with a lot of students who sort of neutralize their own desire because they couldn't figure out how to do it. I never figured out how. I'm still figuring it out. Um, The how doesn't matter. It's the what and why you want it. And I knew the what was I had this burning fire in me to live and be everything I could be and to help others be that. And the why was I want to be happy. (laughs) I'm not going to be happy unless I do that. Unless I fulfill every part of myself, I have nothing to give. So I wanted that, and I wanted to be an actress as much as life itself. And the passion was so big that that's what got me to Hollywood. And that's what got me to Jerome Robbins. That's what got me to West Side Story. That's what got me to the awards. That's what got me to New York. That's what got me to write my own play, plays. That's what got me to TV. That's what got me to film. Power of that desire, but there's another part of it. You have to believe that you can have it. And your beliefs have to be changed if they're limiting. And I had to change my limiting beliefs 
that I heard every day growing up, which is we're poor people, we're poor people, we're poor people. Nothing was available in those beliefs. I had to step by step change those beliefs and I had to follow my inner belief, which was that's wrong. <laughs> Everything is possible. Look up at the sky. Look at the night sky. Look at the stars. Look at the sun. Everything is out there. So I believe that with my whole soul. And that's what I try to help people with is to elevate their, their belief system. I absolutely love that. And you know, I agree with you a million percent because we choose what we want to believe. We choose, and that forms our life. Exactly. You, you we are. Yes. Yeah. You are an extension of what you believe. I love that you said that. Yeah. There is so much that is available from Susan on the post from the notes of the show that you can connect with her and her husband, David, take a look at their website, what they have to offer. You will want to connect with them on many different levels and places. So I encourage you to do that. And I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for sharing your emotional story, your exhilarating story, your faith, your honesty, Everything that you shared today, I thank oh. you from the depths of my heart for being on Never Ever <laughs> Give Up Hope. Carol, and you are the so poster girl for my show. <laughs> oh, God bless you, Carol. I know he is. Thank you for listening to Never Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Graham. Did you know that most people succeed because they are determined to? Quitting was never an option. Carol loves your comments and will respond to each one. So please subscribe and review this podcast. A rating of five stars would be outstanding and appreciated. Remember, if you are still here, there is always hope.